I explain in the manual how training is very, very different from lecturing. And here's an example which shows, I think quite well, um, some very real problems if you take the lecturing approach. Uh, it's a session about how best to take good photos. If it was a real training session, then surely the students would be engaged in lots of activity. For example, they might start off by looking at a whole range of different photographs and then discussing why they thought that some were good and some were less good. And then the trainer would contribute to the discussion by making some teaching points about how to make good photos. Uh, then to end the session, the students would put those teaching points into practice, surely, by taking some photos themselves and then getting the trainer to give them feedback on how well they'd done. However, in this example that you're going to see, all the students are able to do is sit and listen to a lecture that goes on and on. And, well, you'll see from their body language what they think about it. In the process, he was able to get the great photographs because he was ready for that timeless moment. Your camera, like we said, must be set, and you must be focused. Two, you, chances are you get a very good photograph if you already had a pre-notion of if you already drawn out an agenda before leaving home. And once you are there, your compositions are really strong, and you already made up your mind, you pre-focus your mind, and you are about to eliminate clutter. And so the lecture continues, with the students becoming more and more frustrated as it goes on, wanting to contribute, wanting to discuss things, longing to do something, but never having the chance, never being invited to do so. So what happens? Well, after about 10 minutes or so, the students break out. They snap their chains. They hijack the session. And the trainer is no longer in control. I totally disagree with you, because I may be shoot like this, but it's also important for me to shoot like the other people with a while. But the important thing is to get the picture, to keep it in focus, to isolate clutter, Not and always. to keep it simple. No, no. The idea to focus properly, I could understand, but isolate clutter, I totally disagree. But the way it was cropped, the way it was shot, and the lighting in it, automatically the eye goes to the boy. Yeah. Okay. So the clutter and the and the and the distractions are not are not really of relevance. In skills training therefore, lecturing is out. It just doesn't work. Not like that anyway, a great continuous stream for minutes and minutes on end. What we have to do instead is break up what we have to say in smaller, digestible chunks, with lots of space in between, space for discussion from the students, with the students, above all space for activity. All the research that has ever been done confirms that the very best way to train people in new skills is through activity. Setting them tasks, giving them assignments, allowing them to learn by doing. So, here are four examples. In the first, students are sitting at tables because the task requires them to write. What happens is they're shown a photo and it has no caption. And they're asked, first of all, to guess what they think the caption might be. I will give you stickers. Write a word. Just one word? Just one word. One word. Who's gone? Give yeah. it to me. Sucks. Then later on, they're given a chance, each of them, to write captions themselves. This one, it will help you to write what kind of information should be written to write a proper caption. Image alone doesn't work in photojournalism. It doesn't work. It needs Absolutely. And it's following that activity that the teaching really begins, with the trainer taking the opportunity, reviewing the captions that they've written, to himself make teaching points about how best to write them. The second example also uses stickers, but this time takes the process a bit further. Firstly, to stimulate discussion. Secondly, 
to encourage and indeed to challenge people to think more. What is your criteria of news? Just write down in only one word. What is your criteria? What do you have that? We have unusual. Can you explain me? Really? What, what do you mean unusual? Um, we use the example of uh, if a dog bites a man, that is not news. Okay. But if a man bites a dog, that is unusual. And you can put that in court as news. What if the dog bites the president? Oh. Well, it's still a dog biting a man. But then, really importantly, the trainer gets the students to test what they've done against a specific example to check if their news criteria are valid. I would like to know what is the relevance of tsunami in the people on the world? It's very relevant because it's a big uh, happening there. And uh, if you put it in the news, everybody will know. And Everybody will become conscious about what is going on. It isn't, it isn't relevant to me, but one, I want to see how will the world respond to it so that if, if sometime mm -hmm. or one time something like this should happen mm -hmm. in this region, maybe I will have a better <coughs> knowledge on how the world is going to react. Of course it is relevant for the victims there, people who survivors there. Here too, the trainer will use the student's stickers to trigger his own teaching points, in this case, about the best news criteria to use. However, there's a limit clearly to the amount of activity people can engage in when they're sitting down. So here's something different. They're on their feet. They're active. They're thoroughly engaged in selecting a sequence of photographs for a magazine layout. OK, each group had to make me a proposal. A final design. Yes, yes. This may be the two. This is the work for reference. So, this is the Yes, They're divided into two teams so that the trainer can, at the end of the process, choose which spread he prefers. What I saw here, if you are looking um, through the, the people or the environment, I think you're doing pretty well. And from that, I think it's perfectly clear. The more you can engage students in real activity, physical activity, the more animated they'll be, the more focused, the more involved in the task, the more they'll get out of it. Even better is when you go on from the activity to give people a chance not only to tell you what they've done, but to explain why they've done something and how they've done something in a particular way. And here's a final example to illustrate the point. The task this time for students is to work out how they would have covered the Asian tsunami in 2004. Again two teams, and at the end of the activity, a chance to debate, to have a real heated debate as to which approach is better. Like if we're in a neighboring country, we're not going by helicopter. Yeah. We have to take a jet line, a jet. <laughs> Go there first, and then maybe hire a helicopter. And we assume that we are not in the country. As, <laughs> so as we assume different. Yeah. 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 That's the reason why we choose. Because we were not. Yes. No, we understand perfectly the case because that's the reason why it's totally it's different priority, yeah. to have the information or the event at the same moment that it's happening. And okay. then we are going to be prepared to be there one or two or three later, uh, days later as... No, this is too much to be there immediately. So what do we conclude from all that? First of all, please, don't go away with the idea that all activity-based training has to involve stickers and flip charts and two teams, not at all. Those are only examples. You will design training according to your purpose and you'll surely do things differently. may not use any of those particular devices and that's fine. However, the central principle should still apply that the more activity-based you can make your training, the more effective it will be. Deciding, then delivering key learning points gets to the real heart of training because it's where we teach. So it's crucially important to get the thing right. And here's an example where a trainer absolutely gets it right. He's worked out in advance precisely what his key learning points need to be, and then when it comes to delivering them, he does so crystal clear. The topic this time is to choose the best shooting position to cover a soccer match. And by the end of the session, the students have absolutely no doubt which the best position is. Pick up the pencil again. Now you have A is in the tribune up here where the seats are. B is in the field up in the middle. 
C is where the corner is, D is midway between the goal, and E is behind the goal. Where would you sit? C. C is my... C. 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 Can I tell you why? Wait. C. 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 Three. In the real world, can we move from one place to another? You can, but I why? accept. I want to be in A and C. You're carrying a lot of gear, remember. Okay. You have angles, yeah, you have a chair, you have a laptop. Okay. <coughs> Just this. A. A. In the, in the tribune. You can. Yes. In my experience, C and D are very similar. They're good. But C is the best. Okay, why? Because you're mainly shooting with a long lens. Long lens. This is the area that you will be shooting at. So, you can shoot with a long lens here and here. D, this will be out of reach. You'll have to change cameras. Yeah. Okay, you'll have to go to the 200. Here, you can only shoot when there's an attack on the ball, ball which sometimes is never. Here, it's too widespread. Your movements will be very fast because you're going to pan. You cannot get good quality pictures, tight, compact, if you shoot from A. So I believe C is the best, D is second best. And that's a job really well done. The starting point is thorough preparation, deciding in advance what the key learning points are that you must get across, and then working out the best way to do so, so that they're absolutely clear. Here's the absolute essence of activity-based learning. Giving students things to do, and then reviewing them and giving them feedback. And if it's that crucial, it's got to be done well. So, here's something for you. If you like, it's a kind of activity-based exercise for you to do. What I'm going to do is show you a series of comments from different reviews of different training sessions. And then I'm going to leave it up to you to judge for yourself what you think about them. For example, are the comments honest? Are they fair? Are they balanced, giving praise when due, but also picking up things which weren't so good? Are they aimed at the task, not the person? Are they detailed and specific? Are they forward-looking? In other words, suggesting specific ideas to improve things. Are they understood? And above all, are they constructive? That, that's something I missed from this presentation is what should I get from this presentation? The angle of the picture that I should do for, for this kind of situation or how to do or how to shape ourselves? For example, if Jimmy provides a cyclist, you know, the, with contents, the list of equipment that everyone use bring daily, you know, it's a routine part. So maybe we can start an activity with this like market, you know, things that we usually bring all the day. And also I like the way he he controlled the discussion by putting a, I don't know if it's a divide, but he's very clear on saying advantages, disadvantages, yes. similarities, yes. differences, uh, crucial, but it's not crucial. Yes. I thought about doing it in two ways. I did it in one of them this morning, which is I... I say what I did, and then I ask for their feedback. Yeah. But there was another option, which is I, I explained the situation, yes. and I would have started by asking them what would they have done, and then told them what I did, and again, going to another point, asked them which one would be better. Well, you tell me, which one do you think would be strongest? The second one. Yes. The one I didn't use. Yes, you were quite right in, in painting the scenario. Yes. So that we all know what this is all about. Mm -hmm. But then actually pull. Yeah. Don't tell them this is what I did. Push, 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 push. Pull. Engage. Draw them in. So okay. You imagine yourself in that position. Yeah. Huh? What's it feel like? Yeah. How dangerous is it for you? Yeah. What's 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 the shot angle like, etc. How much of the story can you cover from there? Huh? Pull, 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 pull. Get them engaged. Point of principle I was mentioning yesterday, the more you can stimulate them to think, the more they will learn through the process. And since we're talking about activity-based learning, here's a final task for you. Not for now, but for later. Maybe you could take that same list of feedback principles, because they're printed in the manual, and use them to test 
the feedback that you're giving to your students. What are you doing well? What are you doing less well? How might you improve the feedback you're giving so that it's even more effective? If you get the balance right, everything goes well. You get your points across, but not too many and not for too long. And the students in their turn, they're able to participate, but not so much that you lose control and don't teach them anything. However, if you get the balance wrong, you run into all sorts of trouble. And here's a session where that happens. Mind you, it starts well with pull technique, activity and discussion, in this case, about how to deal with complaints. You complain, you complain, you complain, you complain, you complain, right? When you complain, what is your expectations to the person that you complain? Would you please to write it up? You have stickers? One word. What did you expect or what you expect? What is your expectation when you complain? What response do you have? Who's done? Baha. Would you please to, to, to show you? What would you write? Uh, improve attitude, his attitude. Improve his attitude. Do you agree? I, I expect that the person I'm complaining to does what is right or does what I want or how I want it done. To follow up your... No. I, either to do something right or to do something the way I want it done. Okay. Okay, uh, Billy. Yeah, it's the remedy. You expect a remedy. So far, it's all pull, and it's gone very well. Everybody is engaged and involved, but the trainer hasn't taught them anything yet, so now he needs to push. Trouble is, all that pulling took far longer than he'd planned, so now the trainer feels under pressure, and that's when things go wrong. Okay, so we have seven different response. It's good, you know? It's good, good, good response. So, yeah. Okay, in this almost 15 minutes we have, I have to speed up this class because we have not enough. There are several important lessons coming out of that. Pulling before pushing is good because it hooks people. But running out of time is bad because it makes you push too much. So you revert to lecturing, you rush through material, you don't do anything in depth. Also, having a long block of pulling followed by a long block of pushing is bad even if you've got plenty of time because it's too heavy. It's lighter, it's more digestible if you like, if you break things up more. A little bit of pull, a little bit of push. Pull a bit, push a bit, all the way through. If you remember that communication is a two-way street, you'll get it right. Here's a well-known fact about presentation. When we communicate with somebody face-to-face, -face, the impression we make on them comes from different parts of us. The words we use account for only 7% of the total impression. How we say things, so say our tone, accent, inflection, emphasis, make up 38%. What we look like and how we behave account for a massive 55%. Now, what that says for trainers is how important presentation is, how we present ourselves, and how we use different training tools around us to help presentation. Here are some examples. First, using overhead projection in different ways, showing text, still photos, video, and even music. Using flip charts for posting up stickers. Capturing key points from discussions so they're remembered. The moment, is they are like quite fighting or... Moment. Then. Putting flip chart pages up on walls for people to work on. Or for the trainer to keep important material visible. Then stickers with their different colours, so useful supporting activity. Handouts to use during training and other handouts at the end for students to take away and revise key learning points. And there may be more. There might be a whiteboard or a blackboard or a magnetic board. 
or an electronic board that allows you to print a hard copy handout of what you've written up there whatever will they think of next. But these are presentation tools. They're there only to support you, because it is your presentation skills that really matter. Where you stand, locked beside the flip chart, or blocking people's view, or moving around. Then standing close, creating interest because you're moving, or maybe sitting to encourage discussion because now you're part of the group. The other participants would think mm -hmm. about this criteria. I think that... And the big lesson is this. While we need to spend lots of time and energy preparing our training content, we also must think through in detail how we're going to present our material, what tools we're going to need, how we're going to use them, when, where we're going to use them, but above all, how we ourselves are going to affect things by our own presentation style.